And now for something completely different. Smoke medical weed every day. The following thoughts on Hoppy Hour represent Brian Hoppy and Pastis. Listener discretion is advised. Live from Tampa Bay, you are tuned in to Hoppy Hour. He's the voice of a generation that got screwed by the baby boomers. Welcome back to Hoppy Hour. Hoppy Hour. Hoppy Hour. Happy Hour starts in four, three, two, happy, happy, happy. This is Happy Hour with Happy. What's up? This is Happy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Happy, and let's get right into it. On the phone line is comedian Roy Wood Jr. He is on the show. What's up, Roy? Yo, what up? I have not talked to you in a minute, bro. How the hell have you been? I got no complaints, man. Just living the life this spring. I feel my uh, best to come up with a TV show or something to do and sell, and you know, the same as everybody else. Yeah, I'm drinking alcohol in between time and watching sports. Playing at the Cubs could win more than eighty-five games this season and uh, get back to championship form. I forgot that the Cubs, I forgot that you were a Cubs fan because I'm from Chicago and um, I've been really sad since 2016. I've described it as like hooking up with the most beautiful woman of all time, like your dream hookup for an hour of the best sex and then not getting laid for eight years is kind of how it feels with the Cubs. Yeah, yeah, but are you better off having tasted that goodness Yeah. or would you better off still being at the bar? dry and never gotten anything. I do think that it's good that the Cubs are competitive since 2016, and I think that's the thing that's really painful, because they're like sucking like this in-between land, because they made the playoffs two more years since 2016. I think three more years. So, it's not like they were bad. It's just like, oh, you're close. Even last year, they were, they were in the second wild card, and then Arizona went on a killer run in September and caught the Cubs. So there's a million different scenarios where I wish we just would just trash so I could go back to just what I know. How long have you been a Cubs fan? For me, I've been a Cubs fan for 30 years. They're about the same. So, I mean, I'm 45. I'd say fifth grade was kind of when I really locked in officially, maybe fourth. What drew you to the team? For me, my early memories were Sammy Sosa and then Steve Bard- Bardman was not a really great moment in time. Oh, I go before that. I can take you back in the 80s. Sean Dunstan, Ryan Sandberg, yeah. Andre Dawson's awesome, Jerry Curl. I like the Cubs. They just came on TV more than anybody else in the South. I grew up in Alabama. You that, get the Braves yeah. game. Braves came on at night. I had to type my pops for the remote. Middle of the day, nobody's home, so I get to watch baseball. So I've always been more of a Cubs fan than anything else. It's just because of access. What did you think of Harry Carey? I I mean, as a kid, I didn't know he was like drinking in the booth. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just like, this guy's great. He's a slur, and he's still calling the game like a pro. Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed him. I, I don't really. I don't have, like, broadcasters I hate. Like, I know some people, like, there's people that, like, don't like Joe Buck or you yeah. don't like Troy Aikman or this guy annoys me. They're just all pretty much good to me. Like, I don't know. I just, like, I, I enjoy baseball announcers the way people who don't know anything about wine enjoy wine. It's like, it's all getting me drunk. It's fine. For me, I don't mind the announcers. I'm more, I'm not a fan of the debate shows, like anything with Skip or Stephen A. Smith or Mad Dog. That's kind of where I get a migraine. Because to me, when I think about those shows, like first taking that, I'm imagining being at the gym and being in the locker room at, uh, let's say, LA Fitness, and it's just you're being forced to watch it because all the gyms have that on. Yeah, I mean, but that's also the culture of sports television as a whole. I mean, Fox Sports really is just a copycat of of ESPN. Yeah. You want a fun show, I'll give you, is Good Morning Football oh, on yeah. the NFL Network. Yes, sir. They don't really argue. 
it's fun arguing, but it's not a debate style show. Even in the like, if that's my palate cleanser, when I'm tired of just people yelling about stuff at each other, I just watch Good Morning Football even in the off season. Oh. I like watching it because it puts me in a good mood. Like even if like my team and I don't really have a team because I'm just sort of divorced from the Bears. I can't do it. I can't, bro. I hate the Bears. <laughs> Still mad about Justin Fields a couple weeks later, huh? I don't know how I feel, man. I uh, the thing is, I haven't lived in Chicago in about ten years, so I haven't watched the full game probably since the uh, Parky double doink. A part of me died inside in that game. It was just not the same. That team was so okay that year, and then to just double doink that and then go on Good Morning America and be a victim, I was like, I, I can't do this. Like I, I'll be an open bandwagoner if they get the new QB and they go thirteen and four next year. I'll join that bandwagon in a second, but I, <laughs> I appreciate your honest. I can't do it, bro. I can't. I know that's not going to happen. Because what's funny, Roy, is the first year I watched the Bears was when they went to the Super Bowl in 2007, and I thought that's how it was going to be every year. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Lovey Smith got you spoiled. Yeah, he did. Devin Hester with that kickoff return. I'm like, oh, we're winning the Super Bowl. And then it was no battle between Rex Grossman and uh, Peyton Manning. <laughs> but yeah I, I, I'm excited about baseball season man we'll see what happens I just like the game as a whole so I speak to the whole world as a podcast but I'm located out of Tampa Bay what do you think about the Rays uh, indifferent I need to go to that stadium there's 11 major league stadiums I haven't been to Tampa's on the list but yeah. I'm gonna go to that one last because it's the ugliest it's um I'll say this. When I worked in sports radio, the local announcer died, and he was on the radio, Dave Wills, and he was a really good guy, and uh, I got invited with the media to go to his wake. And I'll say this. Tropicana Field is better set for funerals than it is baseball. Like, it was a beautiful ceremony. It was like two hours. It was amazing. They, they, they should just have funerals there. It's better for that than baseball. It's so uninspiring there. Yo, it definitely is. I've stalled on going to Tropicana, hoping that by the time I finally go to Tampa, they would have built a new stadium, but that ain't <laughs> happening, clearly. And what's funny about that, bro, is it'll be so quiet in there that I feel like I have to whisper or then, like, Wander Franco is going to know what I'm saying. Like, I feel like they're going to hear me because I'm a very loud person. So when I'm at the Rays <laughs> game, I feel very on edge. Uh, <laughs> It's just funny how how that works. Like when they're good, all of a sudden they might fill up one third of the way. There's this weird, weird thing with the Rays, bro. They have their fans, but their fans live in this imaginary world that the that the Rays matter because they have a core fan base of Florida people that love their team. Because the Rays are in the top 10, top 15 ranking of ratings on Bally Sports. Like, people do watch the Rays on TV, but there is just this, there is this disconnect, Roy, where Rays fans just don't want to drive. It's weird. Yeah, and to be fair, the stadium's also on the other side of the bay in St. Pete, so maybe that's part of it. But I don't believe just bringing the stadium across the water 14 miles is the be-all, end-all. Yeah to go from 7,000 to 40,000 through the turnstiles. Well, Roy, and I've thought about it too. I'm from Chicago, and I used to wait in traffic for two hours to go to a White Sox or Cubs game. And when I was with my uncle, we waited two hours to go to a Dodgers game. You know what I'm saying. Like You sometimes have to drive a little bit to get to a game. So whenever I hear that excuse of, oh, it's on the other side of the bridge, I'm like, but... That doesn't really make sense. And you can go out and get food afterwards. It's not like it's 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 not like St. Pete's a boring city. Yeah, it's not a ghost town. It's not like I'm trying to think, like maybe like the Cowboys, where the Cowboys Stadium is just like literally across the street from a Walmart. Like it's like just in a random place. Like there's a little bit of stuff around the stadium, but as a whole, that district is not like Oh, it's happening. Let's go to buy the Cowboy Stadium and just have a meal. Like, no. You be there for the game and then you leave. Bro, 
I'm telling you right now, I'm moving on from this subject. I'm telling you right now, the funniest thing that I've seen in 2024 was what you were in, involved in that made TMZ as Trevor Noah, and he's up there speaking to the audience, and you're just mouthing what you were mouthing in the back. That was the funniest thing I've ever seen, Roy. Uh, that was that was a, that was an interesting choice and in place for me to do that, but. It, it, it came out of a play. I was saying, please hire a host because I was just excited for the show. They won an Emmy. Everybody on the stage is working really hard. The Emmy that they won, half of that time, Trevor wasn't there. So they really pulled a rabbit out of their hat, you know? Yeah. And I think that was, I don't know, my actions just came from a place of like, come on, get the show back on the, you know, get the train back on the tracks. And at that point, I'd already left the show. So I didn't know what was going on. And of course, a week later, they announced John Stewart coming back to the show. So, you know, they're, they're that. What's it like working on that show? I mean, it was great. When I left in October, it was still Chang and I call it the greatest job in comedy. I would even put Daily Show for Saturday Night Live in terms of if I could pick a place to work for a decade, you know, even though, you know, it's neck and neck, it's very close. I'm not saying it's like a no brainer, but, um, it's just dope because you get to take in, and this is messed up because to be good at the job at the daily show, you have to know everything bad that's going on in the world. But even though you know everything that's bad, you're still able to be around a bunch of people who are making jokes about it. So it helps to get you through it in a way. So I'd say, you know, the best part of it was being able to take in news, but be around people that, you know, I don't know, kind of some group therapy session stuff and some of the pitch meetings. Well, isn't it weird? Because I work in news talk uh, during the day. I produce a bunch of news talk shows. So I have to hear about all the awful things going on on the other side of the planet. And I've only been at this job since November, so now I'm really learning about things going on in the world. Like, I joined right as everything was going on with Gaza. Bro, it's fucking crazy to think that, like, we'll complain about traffic or a baseball team that can't get fans, but there's real problems in the world. It's hard to explain. Yeah, it, yeah, it really is. And it's, and it, and it's, it's the, the gift that we have at, the, uh, at least I had at The Daily Show, was that, this is horrible, but how can we figure out something of, that's ironic or funny about it? And if not the issue, then what is funny and ironic about the causation of the tragedy or the prevention, future prevention of the tragedy? There's always a quadrant you can get into without stepping on something that strikes a nerve with people that are affected. So, you know, th that's the advantage. Like when I'm guys who work for Vice News, and I'm like, dude, y'all get no breaks at Vice News. Vice News is literally, yeah, today we are working with the war amputees and there's not enough doctors and coming up after the break, the disease is ravaging this village and also the water's dirty. And I'm like, that's your whole day. Like, that's an episode of television for them. And I'm like, yo, man, I don't know how you're able to get through that. So I have so much more respect for, as I like to call it, real journalism. Now, when you were up there doing your bits, was there ever a bit that you had that when you wrote it out, you thought it was fucking hilarious, Roy? You were like, oh my God, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. And then, like, let's say in the middle of it, you're like, this isn't as great as I thought it was going to be. Oh, we did this um, video. We did a parody of Donald Trump where, and this is early on, Trump wasn't even president yet. He was still in the Republican primaries. So we took all of his tweets and made them into rap lyrics. And so we called it Black Trump, They Love Me. And it was funny. It was a hit. It went viral. We dominated the news cycle the next day once it came out. It was great. So then we decide let's do another one and we go well let's make this one an R&B song oh no <laughs> and so I took more Donald Trump quotes and made it into an R&B song and then I got in the studio and just because you can rap don't mean you can sing and oh my god we played it at rehearsal 
and the groans and the faces on everybody. And it just never <laughs> aired. It never saw the light of day. Thanks, sweet baby Jesus. What was so bad about it? Bad singing. Parody rap is funny because we know you can't rap and we're okay with bad sounding rap. Rap is more about the rhyme. It's sure. not about the sonic sound, the acoustics. Yeah. Singing, you have to sound good first and foremost, and then we'll get to the lyrics and laugh. But if we can't get past the sonic chaos, we're never going to focus on the lyrics, and therefore we're never going to take in what it is you're trying to do. So what time would you get up in the morning? Like, what was the process? Because you hear about some shows that, pe that people will just sort of show up and all the prep is ready for them. And then there's some shows that they work on it all day. So when you were the host of it, how long was your work day? Oh, well, I was just a correspondent. I just hosted one week after Trevor left. So I was getting to work at about 8.30 for a 9 a.m. meeting to discuss the topics for yeah, the day. Yeah. But as a correspondent, you could come to the morning meeting. But generally, we didn't get to work until about 10 o'clock after the meeting was done. And they had started assigning segments to particular talent with the show. Now, when you're in like a meeting with all the writers, let's say you write down 10 ideas. How many of them make it to TV usually? Ooh, one week it might be zero. The next week it might be nine of them. Would it just no, depend? It's, like, it's um, very collaborative. Like it's, did it's, you, it's, it's yeah. hard to describe, man. Like it's like, like the Daily Show is a bunch of people with a bucket full of Legos. Every day you have to build a building or a car or a vehicle, and so I might find the wheel. You might find the grill and the windshield. Or next week I might be the one that finds both wings and the engine that ultimately becomes the plane to construct. You know, collectively, between the talent, the writers, and the producers, your job every every day is to take a bucket of Legos and build something and present it to people at 11 p.m. When the show is going on, is there like a rush you get? Is there like a rush that is just unexplainable? When you're on, yeah. I mean, it's live performance, so there's always going to be this feeling of excitement to a degree. But you're also still settling in and thinking about the performance. Yeah, because you were very professional up there. I'm not saying that what I'm about to say doesn't really represent that show, but there's shows that I've seen on TV where it's unprofessional and you can tell they were never prepared. But what I always liked about what you brought to that show was it seemed like you really cared. Yeah, I mean, because everybody else cared, man. Everybody else showing up on time and busting their ass and trying to get the best possible segment. And you're out, like, for a four-minute field piece, bro, you're gone for two and a half days. Sometimes you're just out standing talking to people for eight hours, and you might get three interviews that are usable. I'm not out there alone. You got a bunch of cameras and assistants and PAs, and so you want you get this product that we present to be presented with a degree of pride. So yeah, we definitely always clocked in and took the job serious. So what are you up to now? What are you doing in 2024? For me, so I just sold a book, so I'm getting ready to write that. And the book is going to be based on, you know, a lot of the time. And my father died when I was 16. And so I got to thinking about a lot of the people that helped to raise me after my father died. Just the life lessons that we get and not really remembering who we got them from. So I'm definitely excited to to work on that. And then sold a couple T V shows. Can't say where yet. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's it. And then I'm touring and working the road. Have you ever thought about going back to radio ever? I've thought about it, but I want to look at broadcasting first. Radio is a little bit more structured in a way that I'm not sure if I could take a podcast and put that back to radio, yeah, but you yeah. cannot take radio and put it into podcasts. To me, it's double work. So I'm trying to figure out a way to do something that can live in both capacities. And, you know, just kind of like if I record a 90 minute podcast, chop it down to 60 for terrestrial. Oh but yeah, for sure. What is that idea? What is that concept? What is the thing I want to do? And that's the question I haven't been able to sit still long enough to answer. I think I think you would do well on uh, like XM Radio, Sirius XM. I think that'd be a good platform. 
Yeah, I'm not opposed to it, man. It's just a matter of looking at all the hours in the day and making sure I'm not overloading too fast. So I'm blessed to be in a position after I left Daily Show to sit still for a minute, think about what I want to do next instead of just rushing. So I'm just kind of taking that time. Now, you live in NYC, and there's a lot of people that have moved out and have said they've had enough. What is your take on the Big Apple in 2024? I'm fine with New York, but I'm also from Birmingham, which is, you know, a top 10 murder city, you know. So crime is going to be wherever you go. There's going to be something. So this idea that, oh, it's zombies in the street, and oh, San Francisco, and no, it's crazy, and people freaking dumps on the sidewalk. Okay, yeah, maybe so. So then go where and get what job and get what opportunity. So it doesn't bother me. If the question is, am I bothered by it, the answer is no. Yeah, you seem like a very laid back guy. I feel like a lot of people that complain about the shit in the street or whatever, I feel like they're people that get bothered by external things and they're just trying to find things to complain about. You know, like I feel like you're the type of dude that you look for the good in each situation. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely crime and riffraff, but, you know, to put the National Guard on the subway isn't going to change anything. Like, these are bigger policy systemic issues that have to be changed that they keep just hiring more dudes with guns to fix. Create jobs and people don't have to rob. Create after-school programs and the kids are not there acting a fool. But those are the type of programs. And I don't even feel like getting on that soapbox today, bro. No, yeah, yeah. I yeah. just, it doesn't, it does not scare me. I'm just put it that way. To me, it represents just America, how there's rich people and then there's poor people. But like when I go to Chicago, bro, because I'm from there, I'm from the suburbs, and I went there in August for my 30th birthday. It's just crazy how the nicest neighborhoods are so nice and the bad neighborhoods are so bad. Like, there's really no in between in a lot of these big cities. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Uh, it's, it's definitely a change in our society. You know, there's a lot of people hurting, man. So, yeah, it's definitely homelessness is up. Definitely mental health issues are out there. But I just think no matter where you are, you got to keep your head on this swivel. It's America. You really truly safe anywhere but Iowa. <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, I have ADHD and I have mental health things that I fight through all day long. And I can't figure out as a planet if we're really doing a good job with mental health or not because i noticed like in may it's national mental health month and all the hashtags come out on radio shows and tv shows but then i feel like back then when it becomes june we all go back to being grumpy assholes i feel like there needs to be a consistency when it comes to mental health yeah there's definitely windows of give a damn in our society but you know it's Ultimately, it comes down to who the hell we elect. At least that's what I think. Oh, no, I agree with that 100%. I, uh, I just find mental health fascinating because there's just this weird stigma. Some of the dudes just don't want to budge. Like, I have a few friends that would do really well if they went and spoke to somebody or if they did mental health exercises, but they're so macho, right? They're like, fuck that. I'm going to deal with it like a man. You're like, come on now. Yeah, yeah, that part of it is definitely an issue. <laughs> so I'm a man. Yeah, right. And when they do that, they're just acting all toxic. And then if you tell them that they're being toxic, everybody throws out the word woke. No one even knows what woke means, but I'll hear people complain all day long just around Florida men. Oh, that's too woke. That's too woke. I'm like, do you even know what that word means? Like, I'll ask people, do you know what woke means? And they'll go, uh, uh, every time, Roy, every time. And they're so angry about it. If you ask, like, if it's like, it's usually some Florida man, and like, oh, Comedy Central's too woke, or this is too woke. And then I'll ask them every time, Roy, I go, do you know what that means? And they go, no, not really. It's weird. Yeah, everywhere it gets boiled down and then just gets generalized. And then the next thing you know, 
everything lives under that umbrella of a word, even though there's no nuance to really analyzing the point that someone's trying to make. We have lost nuance in our society. So, Roy, now that you're um, going around America doing stand-up comedy, what are some of the issues that you uh, cover? Um, right now, I'm not even doing a lot of politics on stage. I'm enjoying taking a break from it. You know, I rabble a little bit about gun control, but, bro, I'm up there talking about fast food and relationships and then how much I hate self-checkout. Like, I'm trying to keep it as I crazy like- as I can for right now. What's and enjoy it. what's wrong with self checkout? We don't talk to each other. I don't want to We've talk to people. Connection. I, I love the, the fact that they're yeah. getting rid of self checkout because people keep stealing. Good, bring back the cashiers. I need a friend. It is crazy. Like, yeah. I've seen these like memes online, Roy, where it'll say like the best part about self checkout is theft, and I'm like, oh, that's that's good. I'm glad we're seeing that. Yeah, I, I'm perfectly fine with it. We really underestimated how much cashiers are the friends of crazy people. <laughs> I never thought about it that way. It's just fucking when, chatting. Whenever cashiers. someone's crazy, they talk to the cashier. They'll open up to a cashier. Dude, it's you weird. Need those people. And I'll see it every time. Then they begin talking to the people behind them. And I'll like, I try to be outgoing, but a lot of times when I'm shopping, I just want to get home. That's why I like self checkout, is I feel like I'm left alone. Like I don't have to put on this performance of talking to this really friendly person. It's weird. Yeah. And then also, when you do self checkout wrong, the machine volume is super loud and tells the whole story, which is embarrassing. So now I feel <laughs> even dumber. And now, now I'm going to go buy a gun because you just embarrassed me. So uh, when you're talking about fast food, are some of the uh, topics, including the fact that fast food's fucking overpriced now? No, but we do need to have a conversation about why McDonald's hash brown is 2019 cents. I made a what? post. I made a post where I took a picture of the uh, um, the uh, menu and the drive through, and it got like ten thousand shares, ten thousand comments, and like ten thousand likes. And I was like, I didn't know my big moment would be taking a fucking picture of overpriced food, but here we go. It was fascinating. The, the, the interesting thing about fast food griping is that we gripe about it, and we still go back. The price of a junior bacon is no different than the price of gasoline. What you going to do? Kiss my ass. That's the price. I want $9. <laughs> I want $9 for this junior bacon. You going to buy it or not? You know what's really overpriced, though? Is Chipotle. My I God. I thought you were is... going to say sex from strippers. It's <laughs> also that. But keep going. I've never actually paid for sex. I, there's been moments, bro, when I was really alone, and I thought maybe, but once I <laughs> once I watched, I'm not denying when I was 25 after a breakup and I didn't get laid for a year that it didn't wear on me as a man. But, man, when you're done with Pornhub, you have that, like, post-nut clarity where you're like, I'm glad I didn't spend 500 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. It would be different to have that clarity and then that- prostitute the hand over a car swipe machine. Okay, you can either tap or do the chip. What do you think of girls that are on uh, OnlyFans? It's fine. Make money. I know, right? It's safer than getting murdered by some crazy John in a hotel. I know, so it's fascinating. I know a lot of girls... Some pimp taking half your money. Yeah. Put it the house. Dude, I know a lot of girls that do porn because I live in Florida, and my goodness, they can make bank, bro. They can make fucking ten thousand a uh, month just showing their pussy. It's crazy. Oh yeah, hey, good for you. Make the money. Make the money. I'm fully in support of it. I mean, this if dudes could do it, we would. So uh-huh. I don't know why we sit here and act like. <laughs> Ooh, if if women were paying guys for foot pictures, we send pictures of our meat for free every day <laughs> to strangers. So, dude, that does fascinate me because I'll not lie to you. I've sent a dick picture before, and it's so weird to think that like on an, on another girl's phone, unless she got rid of it, is my dick. It's very weird to think about. Yeah. yeah. 
it's not our fault. We devalue ourselves by giving it away for free. Now women will never pay for it. Bro, so I messed up like two, three months ago. Usually I quit sending it out or I would send it for one second on Snapchat and the girl would be like, I want to see it. And I was noticing when I wasn't providing it, the girls would actually want to hook up. And I was talking to this girl off of Tinder and it seemed like she was down to hook up. And then once I sent her the picture via text, all of a sudden it was just crickets, bro. I didn't hear anything from her. It was like I yeah. kind of ruined the moment. I was yeah. like, "Damn it!" <laughs> <laughs> you gotta keep it on the low. What do you think about dating apps? Is Roy on dating apps in twenty twenty four? No, I don't do that. Man. I still meet. I'm lucky enough to still meet people the old fashioned way. You know. Workplace harassment. <laughs> you don't, you, you I'm don't. joking. I'm talking I about like just meeting you know, your friends, introduce you, and stuff like that. Well, how often, if you're like talking to a girl, does a girl ever go, I think I've seen you before somewhere? Sometimes, but usually by the time I'm out with someone in person, they already know who I am and what I do because yeah. this awesome safety protocol background check type of shit they they're already kind of you know looking through things yeah the um google does not forget things like there's a lot of reddit topics about me bro and it's 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 just funny like you can pretend like something is in the past or whatever but man bro google is not your friend <laughs> yes google will definitely leave you angry We'll leave you. Uh, hey, remember that time nine <laughs> years ago when you took that drunk picture? It's like, whoops. Thanks, snitch chick, Google. <laughs> and it's, especially, both me and you have very unique names. It's not like your name is like Robert Johnson. So if you type in Ryan Hoppy or you type in your name, it's going to show it because you got unique names. That's the blessing and curse about having a, a name that's very unique is that it's very Googleable. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, man. But I'm all for it, man. So I, I, I'm lucky. I don't have to go on the apps yet, but I'm not opposed to it. If it gets, if it, if it comes down to the come down, I'll log in. So we are uh, based out of uh, Tampa Bay, but we speak to the world. But are you going to be coming to Tampa Bay anytime soon? Yeah, Tampa, May 11th. I don't remember the venue. Just go to my website, RoyWoodJr.com. And um, you can get some tickets, man. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I say yeah. I'm getting ready to get this boy out the car and get him set for the afternoon. You're but good, I would bro. love for everybody in Tampa to come through, man. I'll be there for sure. I'll definitely go to your show, Roy. It's been a lot of fun having you on the show, and I will see you in a few months. Okay, done deal, bro. All right, thank you, Roy. Yeah, man. Talk soon. Peace. Happy hour. Happy hour.